It is indeed a privilege to be here tonight. I don't often get a chance to listen to other speakers, but I've enjoyed what I've heard tonight, and I hope you have too. We've sort of come full circle. We started local, we went international, yeah. we went local. And I make it universal, <laughs> or galactic if you like. My normal college lecture is about 90 minutes long with 80 PowerPoint slides. Uh, we're not going to do that tonight. I can't talk that fast. I want to take a somewhat different approach. I had my youthful experience which helped shape me and made me fit for ufologizing, if I can coin a word. My fifth grade teacher, Rose Gutkin, during a science talk, put science in quotes, told us how the sun stands still and all the planets circle around the sun. And I piped up, uh, Miss Gutkin, I just read it in our encyclopedia, which we bought for 29 cents a volume at the supermarket way back then, in Linden, New Jersey a name that shall live in infamy. <laughs> uh, the whole solar system is moving around the center of the galaxy at 12 miles a second, it said. That seemed awfully fast to me. <laughs> and she said, oh, no, 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 that's not right. This is what it says here, and she went on. And I wasn't accustomed to being talked down to by a teacher, but okay, the next day, I brought in the encyclopedia. And she read it and rather reluctantly said, well, uh, maybe that's right. I learned a very important lesson. Have facts in hand before putting mouth in gear, or head gets chopped off by the authority figures. I was in high school debating, and it came in handy there too. I learned another lesson. Never make up a fact. <laughs> you can't get by with those. So I have been on the hustings, if you will. I've had a chance to see, speak in all 50 states. Uh, next month, I will speak in the 10th province, Newfoundland. They finally decided to bring me up there. I just got back from Poland. I've spoken in 18 other countries. My message is usually pretty straightforward. Four major points. One, the evidence is overwhelming that planet Earth is being visited by intelligently controlled extraterrestrial spacecraft. In other words, some UFOs are alien spacecraft. Most are not, I don't care about them. Two, the subject of flying saucers, and I prefer flying saucer to UFO because all flying saucer UFOs, very few UFOs are flying saucers. The subject of flying saucers represents a kind of cosmic water gate. Some few people within major governments, including ours here, have known since July 1947, when a couple of flying saucers and several alien bodies were recovered in New Mexico, that indeed some UFOs are alien spacecraft. Three, there's no good arguments against the first two conclusions. And four, we're dealing with the biggest story of the millennium. Visits to planet Earth by alien spacecraft, successful cover-up of the best data by governments around the world. That's the beginning. Now, in my lecture, I cover five large-scale scientific studies I try to shock my audience into recognizing that there's a lot they don't know. After each of those studies, I ask how many people have read this one. If I'm lucky, it's 2%. One reason for doing this is it keeps the guys who don't know anything from getting a free podium, because they're afraid to take me on when they realize that they don't know anything about the subject. I also find that most people are unaware of advanced technology. There seems to be a strong prejudice that if you're not at a university, you're not doing research. But I spent my time in industry, little companies, GE, GM, Westinghouse, uh, McDonnell Douglas, TRW Systems, Aerojet General Nucleonics, 
obviously can't hold a job. That was all in 14 years. <laughs> I set a record for working on canceled government-sponsored research and, research and development programs. It wasn't my fault. I mean, and some of them were good size now. And for those of you in academia, think about this. In 1958, when I was working for the General Electric Aircraft Nuclear Propulsion Department, we spent $100 million. We employed 3,500 people, of whom 1,100 were engineers and scientists. Back then, $100 million was a lot of money. Now, some people think it's only chump change today, but I still think it's a lot of money. Now, one thing I like to do, and I did this in, of all places, Saudi Arabia a couple of months ago, where they had the fifth annual Global Competitiveness Forum in Riyadh, Saudi Arabia. What's a nice Jewish boy doing in Riyadh, Saudi Arabia? <laughs> I wrote first to make sure they'd let me in when I got there. <laughs> they said yes. Uh, I showed pictures of a nuclear rocket engine, for example. This big, power level of 4,400 megawatts. Le Pro is 2,200 megawatts. So is Grand Coulee Dam, electrical output. This big, nuclear fission rocket. Not just an idea, but it was operated. I talked about a nuclear-powered aircraft carrier that can operate for 18 years without refueling. But I also talked about nuclear fusion. Fusion is the source of energy of the stars, all of them. We didn't figure that out until 1938. Being the good earthlings we are, we put it to use as soon as we could. In 1952, we exploded our first H-bomb. Released the energy of 10 million tons of TNT. Now, a big bomb during World War II was a 10-ton blockbuster. We upped the ante in 10 years from 10 to 10 million. Now, I mention this not to scare you, although it scares the heck out of me, but and the Russians blasted one off, that was 57 million tons of TNT energy release equivalent. But to point out that if you were to use nuclear fusion for a propulsion system, and I worked on a study of that way back in 1962, you could kick particles out the back end of the rocket that have 10 million times as much energy per particle as you can get in a dumb old chemical rocket. My mantra is that technological progress comes from doing things differently in an unpredictable way. The future is not an extrapolation of the past. A laser isn't just a better light bulb. Those nuclear rockets are not just better chemical rockets. Entirely different physics involved. Now, what comes out of this is a recognition that everybody Every advanced civilization out there, and I think there are billions of them, is going to try to figure out how its star produces its energy. We did, and we're primitives. My evaluation of our society from an alien viewpoint is that we're a primitive society whose major activity is tribal warfare. That's a fairly accurate picture, unfortunately. This year, we Earthlings will spend a trillion dollars on things military. Every single day, 30,000 children die needlessly of preventable disease or starvation. Does that combination of numbers make any sense? Not to me, it doesn't. We are right at the beginning of a new view of ourselves and it sends me to bring the bad news to those who think that man is at the top of the heap. There was a study done about what would happen if we encountered aliens way back in the early 60s by the Brookings Institute. And one of the comments was that one of the groups that would be hurt the most would be the scientists. 
They suddenly realized they weren't the big shots they thought they were. I think we live in a neighborhood, a galactic neighborhood, that's chock full of intelligent beings. One reason for coming here is to make sure we don't go out there. You see, flying saucers finished the job that Nikolaus Copernicus started of taking man out of the center of the universe. You remember old Nick, 1543. He had the gall to publish a book, the same year he died, so he wasn't burned at the stake, uh, a book which said that the Earth was not the center of the universe, the sun was. The book was banned for 300 years. Now we realize Kepler results just found, uh, oh, another 1,200 and some exoplanets. 60 years ago, we know there aren't any other planets out there. If there were, we would know about it. There goes arrogance again. The basic syndrome is, if that were true, I would know about it, says the smart scientist and the smart journalist. I don't, so it must not be true, and I'm not going to waste my time learning about it. That's why I have to write books. You're not going to find the information in the newspapers. Incidentally, we went over already. Uh, one quick plug. Uh, there are five books out there. They're all autographed. Uh, two of them are by two of us, and it's autographed by both. They're only $15 each, and 20% of the funds go to the MD Association. I want you to think about the fact that when you look up in the sky, you're off in a corner of nowhere. We're nobodies. Maybe if we looked around a little bit, we could learn how to be somebodies. Thank you very much for listening. <laughs>